So our two wonderful speakers this morning are from the Mara Elephant Project, which we're going to hear all about from their talk. Our first speaker today is Diblex Lesalon. So Diblex is the visionary force behind the captivating podcast Boots on the Ground. And I really encourage you to follow that podcast on Spotify. Really incredible. Um, he's the creative lead, embracing the power of one-on-one -on -one conversations to amplify the voices of conservation. Um, he's a masterful host and he orchestrates compelling dialogues and seamlessly navigates a myriad of really captivating topics and diverse personalities within the realms of tourism and conservation. Currently, Diblex is the communications officer for the Mara Elephant Project, um, stationed in the Lumet Conservancy in the Maasai Mara. Um, and he is guided by an avid passion for community-led conservation initiatives and conservation tourism, passion for nature and nature positive travel. And he's an African Conservation Voices Fellow. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Tourism Management from Strathmore University. And our next speaker this morning is Wilson Sarua. Um, Wilson grew up in the Maasai Mara and he joined the Mara Elephant Project team in 2015. Um, Wilson's role at Mara Elephant Project is all encompassing. Um, he's tasked with tracking all 23 of the Mara Elephant Project's collared elephants um, and relaying their coordinates to the Mara Elephant Project ranges. Um, he also must keep up with uh, real-time alerts for elephants endangered or failed collars. Um, he's in charge of back-end data, any necessary data to help track the range of movements um, and any other data collected. Um, he's also taken a leading role in the school's planting initiative, in the Chili Fence Project and, our up and their upcoming unmanned aerial vehicle reint reintegration. Um, and after finishing high school, Wilson completed a diploma at the Mars MRI University in social work and community development. And he then taught children at Olomoncho Primary School before joining the Mara Elephant Project. So I just want to say a really, really warm welcome to you guys. Thank you so much for agreeing to speak for us. And also a huge congratulations for your 12th year anniversary this today on the 12th of September. So I'm just going to stop sharing my screen now and invite Diblex and Wilson to share their screen and give their talk for us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sia Vogan, for, for that introduction. And um, I'm here with Wilson Zairoa, um, um, and uh, uh, it's uh, we are very honored to be uh, joined today by uh, students from our, the Wildlife Tourism College and uh, Masai Mara uh, University as well. And um, it's really an honor as we are celebrating our 12th anniversary. I think it's a good timing, you know, to share our story and to, you know, bring in uh, more people in this conversation, conservation conversation. And um, yeah, uh, we will be sharing about uh, our project, our Mara Elephant Project and all the work that we do. And uh, let's make this interactive and fun. And uh, we love talking to young people uh, because you are the next uh, conservationists, you are the next researchers, you are the next, um, uh, you know, rangers as well. So, and and tour guides who who play a big, big part in driving uh, ecotourism and conservation in the greater Mara ecosystem forward. So we are really honored to be part of this conversation. I will begin um, uh, the presentation and uh, my colleague Wilson will take over at some point. Uh, so Mara Elephant Project was established in 2011. And our mission is protecting elephants and their habitats across the greater Mara ecosystem. Uh, the project was started at the height of the poaching crisis in the Mara um, uh, during this year. And um, our four friends came together, uh, uh, Mark Gross, uh, the late Richard Roberts, the late Colin Church, and the and uh, Brian Heath uh, at the Mara Triangle, you know, to, to form this uh, project. And uh, with an initial funding from our, one of our co-founders co called Susie Fessenfeld, uh, they started the project. And um, we only started with eight rangers. Now we've grown to over, uh, you know, uh, having uh, employed over a uh, hundred Kenyan men and women, not only as rangers, but as researchers, uh, you know, us in the operations team, cooks as well. So the organization has really grown from when uh, we started. We also have a cutting edge um, uh, uh, research and uh, uh, conservation department headed by our very own Dr. Jake Wall and his team of researchers who go 
out, you know, daily and week on a weekly basis to identify and, uh, you know, monitor all the elephants in the greater uh, Mara ecosystem. And so uh, we have nine ranger, uh, you know, teams now. Uh, we, we launched our, our latest ranger team, the Lima team, uh, which is uh, uh, tasked with patrolling and, uh, you know, uh, taking care of, uh, you know, uh, elephants and protecting the habitats and the communities in the Mosiro area. So we have a total of nine ranger teams and all of these teams are core teams. You also have female rangers. We are, we are really big into, you know, pushing a female representation and uh, pushing women uh, on the front lines of conservation and driving so social change uh, on that sphere. So uh, that's uh, uh, pretty it. And we'll be sharing more about uh, our conservation technology, what our research team does in the next uh, few slides. So just to give you a, a brief outlook on where we are located, we are definitely in uh, the African continent in Kenya, and uh, the middle map they are not clearly visible as well, I'm sure, from your side, shows uh, the greater Mara ecosystem. This is the base map that we've created here internally using our, our, our in-house developed app called TerraChat. And uh, in this map, you can see the green they are showing um, uh, the green there is showing the extension of the greater Serengeti Mara ecosystem. And this area covers 0.1% of the land surface in, in Africa and contains over 40% of large mammals. So it is a very key, uh, important biodiversity area. And um, we have the wildebeest migration spectacle, which happens annually, you know, wildebeest coming from, you know, Serengeti into the Mara, Mara River and, you know, uh, we, plus a, a lot of zebra as well. And uh, you can see a lot of conservancies as well up here acting as a buffer zone and contributing uh, to conservation and employing, uh, you know, uh, deriving or rather uh, a direct benefits to the communities. We have over 20 uh, conservancies. Not sure if you can see the small gray lines there. Uh, those are maps, or oh, sorry, those are um, um, fences that we have mapped and uh, we will share with you how this fencing has really you know affected the movement the free movement of wildlife uh, across the ecosystem you know uh, impacting former wildlife range and dispersal areas blocking off wildlife corridors and we will share more about about that so so far we've mapped over 6000 kilometers of fences our field assistants you know uh, do this using uh, the app that we will share about also in the presentation called terror chat uh, I don't know whether you can see in a query forest over here, uh, uh, the small green, uh, just this part here, we've lost over 95% of the forest cover in your query forest. And this is due to illegal logging, illegal charcoal. Uh, you know, a land has been converted, you know, the community, uh, you know, uh, owns the land. Uh, people are clearing the forest to, uh, you know, farm, a lot of um, uh, fencing as well in there. We have um, a herd of over 80 individuals inside Nyakweri Forest. And we've, uh, you know, uh, collared one of the individuals called Feeds. And we are closely monitoring the, the elephants, you know, protecting the elephants and ensuring they're safe. The communities as well who inhabit Nyakweri are safe. We also have a ranger team called uh, the Golf Team, which uh, leads in the uh, anti-poaching patrols and habitat and security you know, uh, patrols there. And uh, you can see the Mara River right there. That's the lifeblood of the Mara, that last picture, uh, supporting livelihoods and, uh, you know, uh, uh, giving uh, so ecosystem services, not only to people, but also to wildlife. So in our next slide, I'm sure you've heard of the phrase, um, there's no place on earth quite like the Maasai Mara. And I'm sure many of you, uh, who have joined, especially those from, uh, you know, these students uh, that we are addressing today. And uh, most of our listeners also have grown up in this landscape that they call home. It's beautiful. You know, we have uh, the largest uh, lion population, uh, over 500 lions so out of the 2,500 a lion population in Kenya. You know, we have uh, the big five. Uh, you know, uh, we have the wildebeest migration, which I just mentioned, you know, uh, the and the word Mara uh, really means dotted, symbolic of the iconic uh, uh, tree species uh, scattered in the region. And uh, it's a very key uh, bird area as well. We have a lot of birds, you know, raptors as well. And you can't come to the Mara and uh, miss, you know, uh, you know, experiencing the Maasai culture, very rich culture right there. 
and um, uh, you know, uh, you, uh, if you're a visitor here, you've gone to a village, you've seen how uh, they make the fire, you know, the dances, the song, you know, and this photo here was taken in Loita Forest, as you know, Loita uh, and the, uh, uh, the Loita uh, Maasai have really uh, conserved the forest, you know, using indigenous knowledge, driving conservation forward, using uh, local indigenous knowledge. And of course, the wild abyss migration, which I cannot stop stressing about, and of course, elephants, which we will share more about. And uh, why elephants really? So uh, a lot of research has gone into showing that um, uh, their dung uh, is, contains a lot of uh, nutrients and they scatter the seeds. Elephants are ecosystem engineers. They are um, a keystone species. They are a landscape species. And when they, uh, when they cover these ranges, when they go out to look for food and water, they scatter these seeds and uh, the seeds later grow and germinate into small trees and shrubs. They also clear down pathways for other animals in the savanna uh, because they knock down uh, bushes as, as well uh, when they are walking around. And, and during the dry season, they use their trunk, their feet, and their tusks to dig, uh, you know, uh, underground water to, to access really that underground water, especially during the dry season. And elephants are very smart. They never forget. I'm sure you've heard of the phrase elephants never forget. Yeah. And they can eat up to 400 kilograms of food in a day. And um, they stand at three and a half meters the, on the shoulder. Uh, you know, you can't miss an elephant when you're out there on a game drive. They are these big, majestic, uh, gentle giants, especially when they have little babies, as you can see on that last picture there. They're really beautiful and, 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 uh, and, and you can't miss them really. And they help lower food sources as well uh, for other animals to, to feed on um, uh, in the ecosystem. So uh, in this slide, I'll talk to you about the crisis. So, so let's dive into the crisis. As, as I mentioned, when the project was starting, we had a lot of poaching in the Mara. And uh, in, the, in the next slide, I'll show you a, a graph showing uh, an estimate of uh, the percentage of illegally killed elephants in the Mara. And uh, these tasks that you see here are a representation of all the elephants that were illegally killed. Uh, due to poaching and uh, human elephant conflict. So uh, we, we have our intel operations, we have our rangers on the ground and we work very closely with Kenya Wildlife Service. So whenever we say uh, uh, we have these seizures of, of, of ivory, we take them back uh, to, uh, to the Kenya Wildlife Service. Of course, we reprimand and uh, you know, hand over the suspects to, to, to the uh, law enforcement agencies uh, for further action to be taken against them. And you can see there are zebras, you know, this is bushmeat poaching, you know, happening as well. And uh, um, this is essentially uh, because of um, uh, 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 commercialization and subsistence use locally. As you can see in this slide, uh, we have the ivory, we have bushmeat poaching, and we have, you know, some of the suspects that we have uh, reprimanded. And in the next slide, I'll just show you a graph showing how, how those numbers were really playing out there. And in 2012 alone, we lost over 96 elephants due to poaching. And this graph of illegally killed elephants in the Greater Mara ecosystem uh, since we started uh, collecting data uh, in 2011. And good news, 2020, we've had zero, since 2020, we've had zero cases of poaching in the Greater Mara ecosystem. And those are most of the elephants that we are losing now. It's largely attributed to human elephant conflict. Okay, uh, the next slide, uh, and uh, our talk was largely on the war of space. And this is where uh, we really want to put our focus on because uh, we started as a security and anti-poaching. So we've grown from security and anti-poaching to more habitat protection and monitoring. And uh, the human footprint is expanding in the greater Mara ecosystem. So that means more development, more competition of resources and food between people and wildlife. And as you can see here, this is a, a picture just showing you, um, uh, you know, a maize farm that has been raided by crop raiding elephants. And in retaliation, the community uh, spear these elephants, they use arrows to injure them and to chase them away uh, from the farm. So as the settlements are growing, a lot of crops, crop-based agriculture, you know, large-scale 
of, of maize, of wheat is also happening across, across the landscape. A lot of fencing as well, land privatization, you know, land use changes, uh, fencing. So those are some of the biggest threats that uh, we are facing now. And we will share how Mara Elephant Project is combating some of these threats. So you can see uh, this is fencing, and this is uh, you know a map that we've created here internally. And as you can see, um, the fencing has really affected uh, uh, wildebeest migration uh, from you know the Serengeti into the Mara. As you can see, how the the movement was uh, pre pre twenty eleven you know years there. Um, the wildebeest used to come. Uh, through Serengeti into the Masai Mara National Reserve. They cross the river into the Mara Plains and up to the Loita uh, Plains there. Uh, and they loved the Loita Plains because there is this nutritious grass up there. Uh, but you can see due to fencing, that has been cut off. So we no longer have wildebeest going up to the Loita Plains. Uh, so a lot of fencing is happening, a lot of land use changes, as I've mentioned, a lot of land privatization. And, uh, you know, uh, that has really... Uh, blocked off wildlife corridors and their dispersal areas, therefore uh, affecting that migration uh, there. So as you can see in this slide also, it's not just the um, the way uh, even the even the zebras are caught in that frenzy. Uh, you can see a lot of elephants there in fences, and we get a lot of reports. You know, my elephant project, come and take away your elephants. You know, a farmer complaining you know, about, you know, as a, a herd of elephants in their farms. And we, we have to go and mitigate that and ensure, uh, you know, that, that the elephants are safe, that um, uh, the community is safe as, the, uh, as well. Uh, so fencing is a, a huge threat, a huge threat to our ecosystem. And I'm the county government and stakeholders in the Mara are working hand in hand to ensure that we open up these spaces by creating more conservation areas, opening up more corridors for our wildlife to move and, uh, and find food and water as well. So you can see habitat destruction there. Uh, so uh, some of these suspects that we have uh, you know, caught up, we have ranger teams in the Mao forest. We have ranger teams working alongside, alongside our partners, Kenya Forest Service uh, in the Mao forest. We also have a ranger team in the Loiter forest. And these are some of the suspects that we have you know, caught there using uh, power saws to cut some of these indigenous trees. As you know, forests are key habitats uh, for elephants. And um, we, we, we are now talking of climate change, you know, uh, experiencing long periods of drought, you know, uh, you know, and flooding as well. So this is largely attributed to deforestation. As you can see, these people are very smart as well, you know, transporting some of this timber uh, using uh, donkeys and, uh, Um, uh, also, this is Nyakweri Forest uh, on this uh, uh, bottom slide here. You can see a lot of smoke coming out as well. And I visited Nyakweri around March there and I left there a very sad man because uh, you can see the impact and the scale of destruction there, which is really daunting. So our efforts to protect some of these critical habitats for elephants are on the ground. As you can see, our rangers who are, are our boots on the ground, destroying some of the charcoal kins that these suspects use uh, to make charcoal, uh, which is used uh, by a large percentage of, of rural, rural and uh, households for, for making food as well. Uh, so this is Nyakweri Forest, and uh, we have lost of 95% uh, um, of, of the forest covers, uh, as I was mentioning to you. And uh, we've been collecting data since 2000, and, and as you can see, the, this, the red shows the scale of destruction. So this is um, land that has been cleared for agriculture and for farming as well, and uh, for, for construction of houses as well. So the remaining cover is really little. And, uh, uh, you know, we have a hard day, as I mentioned, uh, but, you know, I, I'm not sure whether this is irreversible, but we are working uh, hand in hand with our partners to see whether we can restore some of these degraded uh, landscapes. At Mara Elephant Project, our four aims, uh, we, are, we are aiming on our four aims to connect the dots for conservation uh, uh, through our four aims, which are elephant population protection, human elephant um, human elephant coexistence, elephant habitat protection, and landscape connectivity. And we are doing this uh, through 
uh, the MAP method, which is monitor, evaluate, and protect. Under monitor, we've, de we've deployed innovative techniques and technologies to monitor the four dots. Under evaluate, we are more now into data-driven conservation, and we are collecting all this data and producing actionable outputs to influence our policy alongside our partners as well in the landscape. Under protect, we are working with our rangers, you know, whom we've employed from the community at of elephants, habitats, communities, and connectivity as well. So at this juncture, I will welcome I will welcome my colleague uh, Wilson Sayroa to share more about uh, some of these uh, aims and how we are connecting the dots for conserving the greater Mara ecosystem. Asante Nisana. Thank you so much, Deblex. So I will talk over from here. And uh, <clears throat> the title of our presentation was The War of Space. So everyone is actually in a way, and the elephants as well are also trying the same. So as Mara Elephant Project, so we have come up with a, um, a software which is called Earthranger to monitor all our devices. Uh, that include the elephants, the lion, all actually all colored animals in the greater Mara ecosystem. So what you see here is the Earthranger. And actually from the left side here, you can actually see the reports coming in. So using the Earth Ranger, we have been offenses. So the red color here, so what you see here is actually what differentiate between the safe and the danger area for the elephants. So whenever any of our colored elephant, lion or a, a wildebeest cross that geofence, be able to get a geofence alert message coming to our messages and also WhatsApp. So, and also, from the Earth Ranger, we are also to monitor all the devices that include the vehicles, rangers, patrols, and also the elephants. So how are the rangers patrolling? How are the rangers going to check these colored elephants all the time? So Earth Ranger has been so much helpful in our organization, and we are actually rolling out to all conservancies in the Mara. Uh, coloring of elephants. So the Mara Elephant Project started coloring elephants in 2011. That's when we started coloring the first big males in the Mara ecosystem. We call up bigger bulls. These are the uh, bulls with the bigger tuskers who are highly targeted by the poachers. We also call it uh, uh, crop raiding females. So the crop raiding females is because if you call a one female, that means that you will be monitoring the same, the whole family. But actually coloring one, a bigger male is actually, you will be monitoring one individual. So in this case, the reason why we are coloring elephants, first of all, is because of security reason, was so that we can monitor and keep, in, keep following that elephant. So this will be like life following of an individual. So if that elephant is not moving, the caller will actually update us with a uh, low speed alert. And if an elephant is in a case where the elephant is dead, so the caller will also send us a, a location and also a percentage on how that caller is moving. So this is for us also to rush and go to check that elephant. It gives us a percentage on how the caller is moving. So if an elephant is dead or a caller drop, and then it will give a hundred percent. So in that case, we will be able to go and uh, Check those. Check that individual, and we have been able to recover many tasks of a poached elephant during the poaching seasons. And what you see from this picture is actually two different uh, colored elephant. One on the left is the female called Ivy, who is actually a one tusker, and then on the right side here is a big male called uh, Hugo. He died of old age. It was a success for us because we have been looking for him since 2011 until 2015 when he died of old age. So that was a success. And for this female here, so uh, we have actually categorized these elephants into three categories, just like the way how human being, how for us drink alcohol. We have those people actually who drink when there is an opportunity. So like other elephants, when they have opportunity to go to maize farms. So we have those groups. And then we have actually those drunkards, same case with the elephant. So we call this one the crop aholic one. So these are the elephants who can control themselves. They will go to the farm all day, all night. So the rangers are just keeping following them and moving them back to the conservancy. So Ivy is a, it's a female. And to, as you all understand, females with the young ones keep on looking after the young ones all the time until the age 
when they can actually survive without their mother. And for this female is actually when she has a young baby, even if she is less than a month, she will still go to the farm. So that's why we decided to put this elephant on a collar. So at least we keep on monitoring and moving the herd from going to the to the farms back to the conservancy. So we have uh, we have been deploying the rangers all the time, helicopter, the drone, moving this individual back to the conservancy. And she is now adapting the behavior of grazing in the conservancy and not going to the farm. Uh, so the MAP helicopter is one tool. We only have one helicopter in the Mara dedicated for conservation. So that's a MAP helicopter. And how this helicopter is for monitoring. So every month we have a round going to check all the colored elephants, checking the heart, and also checking any elephant that is close to a colored elephant. In that case, we have been also going around and we have been able to recover and see elephants with the injuries and treat. Uh, the helicopter has been used also in darting elephant, especially if it is in, in the case of treatment and coloring. Uh, and then also we, we are right now in the Mara, the only organization, but we expect many organizations will be able to get a permit to fly the drones in mitigating human elephant conflicts. So the Mara Elephants Project, we have uh, actually trained 16 rangers as a pilot to fly drone. And uh, we are actually training more rangers so that they can actually fly the drone. The reason why we are using the drone is because elephants hate the sound produced by the drone because it sounds like a swarm of bees. So whenever you fly the drone over the elephants, so they will really, they will really run and get out of the farms. So what you see here is actually, we were lucky that we got one Thermo camera drone. And this is actually help us to respond to conflict at night. So you see here, this is the Ivy family. And uh, actually you can actually see the female in front is on top of uh, head over there. That is the collar. And uh, you can actually see the night drone works very well because the elephants can't see it. And uh, so you just fly your drone, switch off all the lights and it will only be the sound. And you can actually see how the elephants are responding. This is actually was in Transmara. So we are moving them back to Mara North Conservancy. Uh, the drone is cheap in, in terms of flying compared to helicopter or a uh, plane. So, and also easy to fly for the, the rangers to do so. It's just that the government has put a lot of restriction on flying the drone in the country, but actually we have been able to manage and acquire the license to do that. So currently we have six drones and we are looking to get more, especially more of thermal camera because all the conflicts happen at night. Uh, yeah, yeah. this is uh, another incident whereby we were called by the community and you well, currently the Mara is being covered by fences, especially in, if you go to Pardama Conservancy where by, it's a corridor which connects many of the conservancies in the Mara. So if people are fencing the land in order to have good grass and water inside the fences. So whenever an elephant get into the fence, it's become easier for an elephant to break it, but coming out because it is being pushed by people, it's difficult. So for us, all the time we are being called to come and respond, move those elephants out of the farm. So if you look at this uh, video here, this is a, a group of four bulls and they were inside the fence. And now you can actually see how they are breaking that fence this is just by use of a drone. So you, the good thing with the drone is you can actually monitor and see where you're chasing your elephants. Sometimes you find you chase your elephants and uh, you find you are chasing the elephant to the wrong direction, meeting with people and livestock. So currently here, what we are doing is actually we are chasing this group to back to the conservancy. Uh, uh, so we have actually come up with a, another research, which is called the Elephant Book. So uh, the Elephant Book is like a, a Facebook for us. So currently Facebook, if you post a picture of your friend and uh, you find that Facebook will tell you who are those people in the picture. So what we are doing right now is actually identifying all individuals in the Greater Mara ecosystem. We have a population of 3000 elephants and we are currently at 1,200 individuals already identified in the system. So we are using a system which is called SIC, uh, and it's actually a system for elephant ear knowledge, 
which actually can recognize which all the images. So you can actually see we have map of uh, 57,000 photos. And actually the individual in that photos is actually 1,116 individuals. So what we are doing is uh, this will be an open, whereby the, uh, even the tourists when they come to the Mara, if you take a picture and post online, so uh, you will be able to see if that elephant is in the system. And if it is not, and then maybe you will get an opportunity of adding that individual and maybe in Uh, so yes, tomorrow elephant project we came up with uh, with uh, also another app which is the TerraChat. So TerraChat is mapping all the spatial earth in the ecosystem. So what you see here is we have the roads and uh, dams, fences. So we have a team that is going around mapping everything. So we have actually put up a grid. So they go grid by grid. So once they're done with the one grid, they send a message and they say we are done with grid one and we're going to grid two. So we have been able to map everything in the ecosystem and we are still going on with that. Uh, so the map rangers, uh, the map rangers are currently we have around 89 rangers in the Greater Mara. That is like when I say the Greater Mara ecosystem. So the rangers, we have nine teams, two in the Mao, we have three in the Lita, one in Mosiro and the others in the Mara and Transmara. So we have a team of 89 rangers, both male and female, working to protect elephants. So Estimara Elephant Project, so we, because it is conflict that is now in, in the increase in the ecosystem. So we came up with an idea of how do we reduce conflict? And this is because elephants are going to farms. So what are we going to do? Which crops, do elephants feed on? So we started a, a what do you call it, experimental farm. This is actually a study to understand which crops do elephants feed on and which ones they don't. So the farm is in Rasmara, whereby a land that we have allocated and say this is a conflict zone. So we have planted over 36 different types of crops. So this is a supermarket for elephants. So the elephants are free to go and feed on any crops that they want, leaving the ones that they don't. So in this case, Sorry guys, I'll just hold for a minute. I have an helicopter flying over, so. Okay, thank you for your patience. So that is our CEO uh, heading to Nabucho for an elephant treatment. Okay, so what I was explaining is a, a map experimental farm. So the farm is open for the elephants to feed on any crops that they want, leaving the crops that they don't feed on. So in this farm, we have actually planted, planted over 36 types of crops. We have maize, chili, lavender, tree, tomatoes. We have gooseberries, everything actually in the farm. So the farm is like when you visit a supermarket, you choose exactly what you want, leaving what you don't want. So same case to the elephants. So the elephants can go to the farm from seven, p.m. to seven in the morning. And they choose which crop they want to eat, leaving the one they don't. So in this case, we are understanding and say, oh, the elephants don't feed on may don't feed on uh, chili or lavender, but they like maize. So right now, if you look at the picture here, some of the plots are finished. Those probably are the maize plots. So we, we want to understand which crops do not do elephants eat. And in that case, we want to also start a, what do you call the lef, a different level of planting. Uh, in an area that we know that elephant cross, like the river point, we will be able to plant like, let's say for example, chili. And then from the second level, we have a lavender, the third level tree tomato. And maybe the last level will be, will be now the maize. So in that case, will this elephant cross all these other crops going for the maize? That is actually the study that we are looking and this share will be actually shared to the community around the Great Tamara ecosystem. So what you see, uh, this is Abigail, the farm manager. And what Abigail is also doing is actually setting up a, uh, a nursery and also teaching other women in, in, in the Longolin area on how they can actually just start a small um, 
a small farm in, in the land, they don't really need to have a bigger land to do any kind of farming. So this Abigail is helping those women in that area. So uh, actually, if you look at the pictures here, these are some of the animals that have been visiting the farm. And you can actually, the hippo, and the reason why you see the hippo here is because uh, the farm is located right on the river. So it's easy for them to assess and go to the farm. But actually the elephants are not left behind. They're always there. The giraffe probably just following the elephants. They don't feed on any crop. And uh, yeah, so these are some of the elephant animals that we have covered from the picture. And uh, as Mara Elephant Project, we also do the community outreach program. So we are on the process currently of going to some schools in Sekenani and um, teaching the kids on how, what we are doing and bringing them here. We take them for a game drive, get to land we, with us. And the uh, Mara Elephant Project helicopter has been uh, very good um, in terms of helping people in equipping people from the uh, Mara all the way to the good hospital, especially people injured by animals and yeah. And then also uh, what we are using because we're using our uh, figures and the figures drum that uh, we are we have in, in the Mara, we are actually giving the community and the figures are being used to make a beehives. And this is also more important in terms of economy, economical benefit, and also protecting the farm by putting uh, beehives along your farm. And uh, also in, in the areas like your Transmara, where we have Nyakweri and the Loiter Forest, we are actually training people to use a, a sustainable project. We, are, we have actually started a sustainable project whereby people can build houses using bricks instead of cutting down trees to build houses. And uh, so the results so far, we have actually educated more than 100 plus children. That is actually the Rangers kids. Uh, we have actually offered a sponsor for two kids per ranger. And then also we have recovered more than 1,000 snares. That is uh, probably more in the mouth forest because people are putting up snares in the mouth forest targeting smaller animals. And then uh, more than uh, 700 sub habitat destruction suspects arrested. We have also recovered more than uh, 2,428 kgs of fivefold. That is from the year 2012 and uh, of our eight uh, colored elephants so far, that is from the year 2012 up to now. And uh, uh, the map rangers along with the government partners have arrested a total of more than 499 kgs of ivory. And you can actually see how the, in different years, how we have been doing the arrest. So in 2012, we lost many elephants and you can actually see the results in 2013, we recover more in, in the same year. So this is how we have been recovering. And uh, the, as, uh, as you can see here, this is actually the map conflicts, how we have been mitigating and responding to conflicts. 2016, and you can actually see in 2020, 2022, the graph is going higher. And the 2021, because of the drought in the Mara, so not many people actually do a lot of farming. And also more many of the elephants they had to move to the game reserve and the Serengeti ecosystem. This is because of the drought. So that's why you see conflicts actually came down 2020, 2021. Uh, yeah, and uh, together with the KWS, the intelligent team have recovered more than, more than 2,500 kgs of ivory. And this is how the graph looked like for the, from the year 2012 to 2022. Uh, and uh, I think this is the end of my presentation. Let me just hand over this to Deblex, talk about the, how you can follow us. Uh, thank you so much, Wilson. Um, so you, you can follow us as we connect the dots for conservation uh, at My Elephant Project on uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, um, Instagram, and um, uh, we are now on TikTok, by the way. Uh, so <laughs> I'm sure many of you use TikTok. And um, yeah, follow us, let's connect, you know, uh, let's engage. Uh, we are also at Mar Elephant uh, on Twitter. And our website is uh, www.marelephantproject.org. And uh, that's how oh, this is uh, an, an elephant we've called, called Fred. He's a very, very huge bull. And this photo was taken by Wilson, actually. We were on a monitoring spree with him around end of June there, and we encountered him uh, at Mara North Conservancy. 
Uh, as you can see, the caller up there and uh, the tasks are really huge there. So as Wilson has shared, we've called, a, we've called some of these big bulls to increase their protection since they are heavily targeted by the poachers. So that's the end of our presentation. And as we say, Asanteni Sana. Fantastic. Like some Wilson, that was such an incredible presentation. Really, really informative. I loved all the images you had there. The video of the uh, the heat sensing of the elephants being traced by drones at night was just really incredible. Really beautiful. Um, so we're going to open um, open the session up to question and answers now. If you feel that you would like to raise your hand using the reaction button and ask your question out loud, please do. You can also use the chat to ask your question. Um, we do have a question in the chat, and that question is from Sybil to start us off, and Sybil's all the way from Germany, and I want to thank everybody in the audience. We've got people from all over Africa watching, a lot of people from the Mara ecosystem, so really incredible to have you all here. Um, Diblex and Wilson, Sybil's asking, how far does the collaring affect the elephant, and what can you do to minimize the effects? Sorry, you didn't get that question. Okay, um, Sybil's asking, how far does the collaring affect the elephant and how can this be minimized? Actually, the collar, it's just like a neck piece, right? You see these neck pieces that we wear uh, as jewelry, uh, jewelry. So it doesn't really affect, you know, the elephants, but in terms of affecting um, their movement and their feeding. We haven't done much research on that, but um, I think there is minimal, uh, you know, effects to it. And uh, maybe Wilson can jump in on this one. Okay. So, uh, sorry. The collar is actually uh, for us. The collar is four kgs, and this is actually compared to the size of an elephant. It doesn't really have any effect. And from the previous years, we uh, we have been coloring. Um, after a, an elephant is put a collar, so when an elephant wake up, it will just touch a collar, feel it will come out, and from there it will not have any effect on it. It will not even be bothering of that collar. Even in the in terms of the family members, they don't really have any effect on it. They'll just have to touch it and see it's a collar and forget about it. So it doesn't have anything to affect the elephant. And then also we are using more of a GSM collars. So all these collars are built in a way that doesn't have any contact or a battery getting contact with an elephant. So it's just a belt going around the elephant neck. Great, thank you so much for that answer. And um, we also have another question in the chat from Rose Bell. I believe Rose Bell is also works within the Mara system. And she's asking, what role does Terra Chart play in your operations and how does it differ from Earth Ranger? Uh, so thank you so much for that. Uh, Earth Ranger is actually a software for reporting, uh, monitoring, um, uh, the colored elephants, the rangers, and vehicles, and all that. But actually, the Terra chart is different because it's actually mapping the spatial layers in the matter, mapping fences, roads, uh, houses, bombers, and everything. So the Earth Ranger doesn't do that. So that's why we have the Terra chart. And the Terra chart can be used by anyone. So even the, the, even the students who want to have it on their phone, can just offer them if they go to around the Massimara during the patrol, if they find a new road, we can map it. And so that one is open for everyone. Fantastic, thank you. We've got a question in the chat from Ian. He says, how has the increase in number and size of conservancies impact, impacted the human elephant conflict? Um, uh, thank you, Ian, for that question. I think uh, conservancies, as I mentioned, play a huge role in supporting conservation in terms of opening up, you know, space, opening up wildlife ranges, easing movement, and opening up those dispersal areas. So I think uh, conservancies have uh, uh, played a very significant role and impacted positively 
um, you know, in terms of minimizing human elephant conflict, uh, as as you can see, there uh, uh, elephants uh, uh, use a lot of ranges as well to access food and resources, and therefore, what these conservancies have done is, you know, there's minimal fencing. There is yes, there's a number of livestock in there, but that doesn't really affect you know uh, uh wildlife per se but um you know playing an important part in you know um opening up their corridors as i mentioned and easing that movement so i think they have really really uh impacted that positively and we can if you can have more conservancies you know uh, across the greater america system not only for elephants really but for other wildlife as well and for communities as well to derive benefits uh, a tangible, real tangible benefits of conservation uh, from, from these conservancies. Thank you. Thank you very much for that answer, Dibilex. It's great to see the amazing work that the conservancies are doing for these animals. Um, I can see that we do have a few hands raised. I'm just going to ask if you wouldn't mind waiting while I see if our primary audience has any questions. Peterson, do you have any questions there? Yes, we do. We have uh, James asking, want to ask a question? Please, you're welcome. So my question Great. is, Hi, that, James. apart from the... <laughs> apart from the employment of rangers and educating the kids, what are other benefits that Mara Elephant Project is... What are the other benefits that the community around it is benefiting from? Yes, thank you so much, Dapit. I think that is Dapit. Uh, uh, let me answer your question. You say other benefits that the Mara Elephant Project is getting from. So apart from the rangers, whereby you know we have many rangers from the Greater Mara, um, we have also other people apart from the rangers. And then also as the Mara Elephant Project been able to support to the schools in the benefited from the electric fence, which the school had a lot of issues of elephants coming in. And this is because it was the only place that was open, not fenced by the community. So the only way the elephants could access that area was going to the school. And because of the security and protection of the kids, we had to fence the school. We also did the same to Olomoncho Primary School. And now we have a Fence school. We have also offered the uh, seed balls to, to the community. So that is in Transmara and areas where people want to plant trees. So we are buying seed balls from the Seed Ball Kenya, which is an interesting way how people can plant trees. And uh, we have shared with them. And then also, we, uh, as we mentioned earlier, all our rangers are also training on, on first aid. So they have been actually offering people the first aid in when for anyone. anyone. All our vehicles and helicopters is also helping people and supporting anytime in uh, people need it. Yeah. That Fantastic. Hope I Thank you, Wilson. Kirsten, sorry again, you can ask your question now. No problem. Thank you. Um, Wilson and Dublex, as I was just going to say, um, as Seal has said, a fantastic presentation. Uh, we are really wonderful, lots of learning. Um, I wanted to ask two little questions. One is you mentioned that elephants never forget, as, as they say, uh, whether you've got any evidence of that. Uh, and the second question is about the tusks of elephants. Um, it's a little bit, I'm sure, for sure, probably quite a basic question, but um, obviously tusks of ele elephants, uh, tusks are very useful for, uh, for digging, et cetera. Um, has there been any cases where they've actually tried to remove or trim tusks uh, to make them less attractive to poachers? Thank you. Sorry, could you repeat your second question, Kirsten? Sure. Um, yeah, so what I was saying is that um, elephants obviously use their tusks for digging and for other important uh, purposes, getting bark on trees, etc. Is there any way where... Um, where the tusks have actually been trimmed or removed to make them less attractive to poachers. Thank you for that. Um, to answer your second question, uh, I think um, uh, we've seen a lot of dehorning happening, especially in South Africa with the rhinos, and uh, um, I, I haven't seen any any cases uh, to, or, or rather any 
anything like that around, uh, you know, Kenya and not only in the greater Mara ecosystem, but um, I think for us really is to find solutions for elephants to coexist peacefully uh, with, with, with the community, you know, just leaving them how they are and not, you know, um, interfering with the, with, with their, with their, with their being, you know, whether it's, you know, trimming the tasks or, um, you know, cutting the trunk, you know, anything really that, that comes out, you know, in terms of what's what's being pushed and agenda being pushed somewhere else, you know, the honing and all that, you know, stuff. I think for us really is to, you know, um, research their behavior, research their movement, you know, uh, uh, find alternative crops, you know, that communities can plant and, and, and enable coexistence really and open up more wildlife corridors, ease their movement because they require large ranges, you know, to move and fight, find food and resources. So for us, it's not really, we are not focused really on the honing and, you know, finding or rather going that route. Uh, I think that's debatable, but uh, yeah, I think our standpoint is clear and uh, it's more of coexistence and, you know, protecting elephants and communities and their habitats as well. To answer your first question, yes, <laughs> that has been proven. Uh, we had collared an uh, an elephant called Matali here, uh, uh, you know, recently, and uh, uh, the elephant I think was collared in in Amboseli. I'm not really sure, uh, but uh, you know, um, initially the elephant moved from the Mara up to 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 Amboseli, uh, you know, just you know, moving to to find food and joining other herds as well during that move, and then later we found out that it came back after close to almost over five years back to the Mara, you know, there must be something that brought that elephant back. So these are some of the instances that we use to gauge, you know, and to, to prove that, that point. I think Wilson can also add on that as well. Thanks, uh, uh, yes, I, I uh, to answer your question, um, maybe uh, some of the scientists have actually published something on that, but, from our organization here. So we have actually called uh, different individuals. Like uh, we had one which was uh, translocated and it was brought to the Mara. And after a few days, a few weeks, we went back straight to where he was uh, translocated. And this are actually is a good way that showing that these elephants will never forget where they came from. So they actually just follow the route all the way back to where he was called. And then also in terms, and many people understand this, I know we have scientists in, in the house here now, is that uh, whenever an elephant I get uh, speared or one of the family member is killed in an area, so these elephants will always remember. And whenever they come there, they have actually either to avoid it or move it in a way that they will actually avoid the danger zones. So they, yeah, that is actually what we have realized and what we have learned from our side here. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much for those questions, Kirsten. I think we're still waiting for Peterson to come back in. So in the meantime, um, Robert, I know you've been waiting a while. Could we please take your question? And then after that, we can get to you, Vaska. Um, Robert, please, can I ask you to unmute? Uh, hello, everyone. Am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. OK, I am Robert Libisi from Wildlife. College, South African Wildlife College. So my question to you is what form of strategies uh, do they have in place in order to, con to address the wildlife conflict? And then the second one goes as follow, what measures can one employ to deal with poaching effectively? Yeah, I'm done. Okay, I'm done. thank Thanks. you, Robert. And Wilson. Okay, so uh, we've shared about some of the strategies that we are, we are using to end uh, some of these uh, uh, human elephant conflicts, which are posing a threat not only to the wildlife but also to the local communities' livelihoods as well. And uh, we we are we are we are we are using drones, uh, which are cost effective, to ensure that um, 
uh, we keep the elephants away from the farms and away from the community. Instead of sending the map helicopter every time and burning gas, you know, uh, we've trained 17 rangers, as we, Wilson has, has, has mentioned, and we are looking to train more rangers to using drones in conservation. Another thing that we are working on is using the firecracker. So uh, we've um, equipped our rangers on the ground uh, with tools that they can use to mitigate some of these conflicts and, you know, not really put an end to it, but what we're doing is we're using all toolbox really to control, uh, you know, as, as a, a case by case basis. So we are using drones, we are using the helicopter, uh, we are using the the rangers who are our boots on the ground, as I mentioned earlier in my in my in my talk. Uh, we are also using um, what we call the chili bombs. Uh, uh, to uh, but we are really moving into away from that now and uh, away also from using the chili fences and more into technologically driven solutions like even coloring as well to understand their behavior and to see and to get those alerts, proximity alerts when they, they break a geofence uh, because these geofences are located in, in settlement areas and uh, in unsafe territory. So we are trying to keep the elephant safe away from the communities, away from danger, and also uh, ensuring that the community as well is safe. And I'm very happy about the project that is happening. The Wilson shared about the coexistence farm project because this is a will create a win-win really for the community and the wildlife. So I can't wait to see after five years what, what this project uh, brings about because we are studying the predation index, the growth index, the economic index, and the social index, you know, in that. And Abigail Simaloy, uh, they're uh, an agronomist and the lead uh, manager there is doing an amazing job with our team there. So those are some of the solutions that uh, we are working alongside with, uh, uh, definitely alongside our partners, Kenya Wildlife Service and other stakeholders uh, uh, in the in the in the ecosystem. Um, uh, in terms of dealing with poaching, um, I didn't get that question correctly, but um, oh, I think no, I was we... saying. Sorry, sorry to cut you short. I was saying, what measures can you? Uh, can one put in place in order to deal with a poaching infected? Okay, so you uh, mentioned the likes got, of, of yeah. drones, which I think answers my question. Uh, unless if you have other other stuff which you can like to add to it. Yeah, I think even drones can be used, especially the thermal uh, drone that has, um, you know, uh, uh, the matrix which has a thermal camera and you can use it for anti-poaching, you know, patrols during the night and you can be able to capture, you know, poachers whenever uh, they are on site. Uh, but when you talk about poaching, uh, we've had uh, uh, zero cases so far um, in the Mara. And um, I think uh, poaching is a problem that is still out there, you know, it's still a threat. They still demand for ivory. They still demand for rhino horn. They still demand for these other products also in the market. And uh, speaking generally, I think it will take a lot of public private partnerships and a lot of intentionality as well from the government and the law enforcement agencies. And we've seen uh, measures being put, especially in the airports really. Uh, and our, our conservation organizations have really taken up uh, this, you know, uh, to to enforce, uh, to bring, you know, suspects, you know, to to put in measures. Like, for example, in the Wildlife Management Act of 2013, stiffer penalties are there. And if you are caught, you know, with with a uh, with a rhino horn or you know trafficking an endangered species part, then it's life in imprisonment or uh, you know around 20 million Kenya shillings fine. So. Uh, the penalties are there. The law enforcement agencies are working around the clock. Um, uh, uh, Mara Elephant Project is a community-centric organization that is on the ground uh, protecting elephants, protecting, because when you protect elephants, you pro it's an umbrella species. You protect other, other, other animals in the ecosystem. So uh, it, it takes a lot of partnerships, and the future is really partnerships. I hope I've, I've answered your question. Yes, thank you. Great, thank you very much, Robert, for your question. And Dibblex and Wilson, again, thank you so much for that really in-depth answer. I see that Peterson and WTC are back in now, so I would like to go back to them and see if there are any more questions. And then Vasco will get to you, and there's lots of questions in the chat as well. So, Peterson? Uh, thank you. I was asking, uh, as Mara Elephant Project, where do you get the money to pay the ranchers and sustain your organization. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I I hope I got your question. You're asking about where do more elephant project get the and uh actually uh where we get our donation 100 percent is actually we get individual donation and we have actually other organization that have actually supported the mara elephant project shelter wildlife trust just to mention a few the elephant corporation who have actually um, supported us with the drones and so actually where we get our donation is more of from individual donation Great, thank you. Peterson, are there uh, any more questions thank you. on I think your side? We have one more. Great. Yes, yeah, please, one just question. one more. So I was asking about, uh, you know, elephant are very destructive, maybe in terms of entering your farm, maybe if you, have, if you are doing farming, do elephant project do compensation for that uh, destruction? All right, thank you so much for your question. Uh, as Tomara Elephant Project, we don't really we don't really do compensation. We all understand that it's a national government that do compensate people, and then also few conservancies in the Mara that actually can compensate on the predation. But as Mara Elephant Project, what we have been offering is like a consolation fund in terms of family family lost. So we have been actually coming in and just giving us consolation to the family when a person is killed by an elephant. Thank you for that. Peterson, any last questions on your side? I don't think they've got any questions for now. So Vasco, you've had your hand up for a very long time. Would you like to Thank unmute you. yourself and ask your question, please? Thank you very much, uh, uh, d and uh, Sairoga for the very nice uh, uh, presentation. I think I missed to work with the Mara Elephant Project for the last 10 years. I've been Masai Mara. It was such an incredible period. And uh, I still like feel like uh, going back and working with you guys. So my question just goes, it's not a very a very difficult one, maybe for Sairoa. I think um, there is somewhere he mentioned uh, in the course of his presentation that uh, they are using, uh, currently they are using uh, elephant book so uh my question is the uh, does this elephant book use uh, artificial intelligence or a manual software like if you get a photo of an elephant you upload you are able to recognize this animal like it was sighted elsewhere and if not you are able to take chance to update in a database or it's like a giraffe spotter that uh, I've also worked uh, with, whereby you get images of giraffe maybe on the right side, and you are able to use manual, you know, patterns identification so that you either update this giraffe as a new individual or as uh, the one that has already been cited again. So my concern is, is it does it use artificial intelligence in a way that it's able to identify and update whether it's a new individual or not. Thanks, Pasco. Good to hear from you again, Bana. So to answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so currently is still we are working in a manual way whereby the team goes out to the field, take pictures. And as I mentioned earlier, we are using a system for elephant ear knowledge. So what, I, what, what does that, how does that work is actually we get a bigger tier and a hole from the elephant ear. So we have actually subdivided an elephant ear into three positions. So if a bigger hole and a tear land on position, on one of the position in the elephant ear, that's actually how we have been able to identify. But currently we have two students who are working on with the AI and maybe probably by next year, we will be using AI in order to identify the elephant. So currently, Bado, not yet. Wow, wow, great. Great, thank you so much for your question, Vasco. Okay, Diblex and Wilson, we have lots of questions in the chat. And um, so the first question is from Jonathan Mpuya. He says, is there a way to minimize elephants' destructions more specific, more specifically to the destruction of trees? Okay, uh, uh, let me say this. Uh, to answer your question, 
so elephants actually, the only way we can actually minimize the elephants uh, and eating the, your, your trees in, in the bomber is actually opening up because you see now why these elephants are coming to the bombers is because they are actually, the land is being squeezed and closed. So you find the elephants and people are sharing same location. And then also you find these elephants are just moving in a road or in an area that is open. So the elephants don't have enough food to go to those trees. That's why they are going to those trees. So uh, if these elephants, because I, to my understanding, and I am not talking in terms of studying on what the results we have, but to my understanding, if you go to your query forest right now, or you go to the later where there is a plenty of trees, so this will not break much of, of these trees. So you will find that they will just be just lying, uh, putting down some trees for the young ones to feed on, but not breaking trees all the time. But when these elephants come out to an area where there is shortage of food, they will have knocked down all the trees for them to feed on. So to minimize this is actually just opening up and having a good uh, area for the elephants feeding and the movement. Great, thank you very much for that. Thank you, Jonathan, for your question. Um, the next question is from Elisa Bowen. Um, she's asking, have any local communities taken up growing the experimental crops that the elephants dislike, or is there a big enough local market for such crops compared to crops such as maize? Oh, so far the experimental farm, it is two years old. So we are still learning. We haven't introduced anything to the community. And uh, we are also looking on many ways not just which crops that elephant don't eat, but we are also looking at the market price and the market available for the crops. Because we, you might come and say to the community, start planting a lavender or sunflower, but where do they get the market for those crops? So we are actually doing the wall study and to make sure that anything that we come out is actually good for the community and good for the elephants, for everyone. So we don't really want to come and uh, tell people to plant crops that they don't get a market for. So we are studying everything actually on this. Maybe just to, to add on that as well. Um, I think what Abigail has done and what the community is taking up, especially the women there is, uh, she's training them on um, uh, building uh, predator-proof kitchen gardens and to grow their vegetables, to grow their tomatoes, to grow their broccoli uh, and put food uh, on their table. So I think that's a very good initiative from that end, you know, the farm there, you know, to women and to to enable them to support their livelihoods as well um so that's what um abigail is also doing fantastic thank you well well done to abigail she seems like she's doing some really great work um the next question from the chat is from dennis simba he says great presentation and it's a great opportunity and lovely that you have one of the large populations of lions do you have any statistics of carnival conflicts and possible mitigations being trialed for that uh, uh, this, uh, uh, thank you for your question. And we, we work together with the Mara Conservation Predator Project, who are based in the Mara. And uh, uh, they really have a data on the carnivores in the Mara. So for now, I don't really have a, an answer for this, but I can go back to them or share the contact information and you can actually ask them about this. Thank you. That, thank you, Diblex. I would just like to say that we actually have the Mara Predator Program coming to give us a talk next week as part of this oh, okay. Mara Conservation yeah. Series. So that would be a great opportunity to ask that question and um, a really great follow up. So thank you for that. Sure. I hope most of you will be able to join next week as well. So mm -hmm. then we have a question from Rubibi Ben Johnson. Great presentation again. Is there any other implications of disease transmission between humans and wildlife? Good question, Rubibi. Uh, uh, to answer that, we uh, disease from elephants to people. <laughs> we uh, don't really have that one, but the main uh, the main one that we have is a disease that is being transferred from uh, uh, animals, the wild bees, to the cattle, and it's killing a bigger number of cows in the Greater Mara ecosystem, especially uh, during the I think it's the breeding season. So we don't really have a, a transmission of disease between humans and wildlife in the Mara or maybe 
I don't I don't know for now. Great, thank you. Well, it sounds like a good thing that you're not noticing any instances of disease transmission. So let's hope it stays that way. Um, right. Then we've got Johan Kruger. Um, so you mentioned that the sound of the drone is effective in driving elephants away because it sounds like bees. Have you experienced using audio tracks of bees to control elephants close to human populations where actual bee fences are not possible? And thank you again for a very informative presentation. Uh, thank you so much. And to answer on that, uh, so the the elephants are very clever, and you find that uh, they will rec they will actually just listen to the sound, and they will go for it if the bees are not coming. Uh, same case has happened to some of the drones that you try to move the elephants and they don't respond because they already realize it's a drone. So we have also tested on that, and but in terms of the drones. Uh, we came up to realize and see that the females to the young one will not respond to the drone. So what we did with that is actually adding a, um, a chili under the drone. So this is a chili, just in case an elephant trying to look at the drone and not respond to the drone, you spread the chili to the elephants. So in that case, the elephants will respond on that. So for now, we have actually tested on that sound and many of the elephants are understanding and just crossing the fence. Great, thank you. So would you say that because the elephants are so clever compared to a lot of other wildlife, it then becomes a struggle to keep being one step ahead of them as to how you can be deterring them because they're getting used and they're learning to these other methods? Yep. Great, thank you. Um, so we do have one more question in the chat. I just would like to point out that um, we have posted the Zoom link for our next talk by the Myra Predator Conservation Programme. That talk will be being held at the same time on Tuesday, the 19th of September. It would be really great if most of you could be there. Um, and then we have one final question from James Muncher. What, it's a, it's a broad question. Um, what are your long-term plans and vision for elephant conservation in the region? Uh, thank you so much, James Mancha, for this Mancha for this uh, uh, profound question. I think um, a long-term vision is to um, ensure we've implemented some of these projects that we've kickstarted. We've talked about the experimental farm project, which is a five-year, you know, long-term goal of ours. So we will be very keen to see the outputs and some of the successes of that project and how we can implement it and scale it up, not only here in the Mara but across. Uh, uh, Kenya and uh, in the continent as well. We are also working hand in hand with our partners, you know, uh, to understand to build a framework uh, for the uh, Greater Mara ecosystem and to understand some of the changes that are happening. You know, more data driven conservation. So we are looking to build a lot of uh, softwares, also you know, moving to technology uh, and to understand some of these. Uh, uh, you know, uh, happenings and changes that are happening in the ecosystem and how we can influence policy uh, and loop in government as well, because they have the power, they have the mandate really to, to take this forward. Uh, tying it to, to our vision, which is uh, uh, working towards a stable and healthy uh, elephant population coexisting peacefully with people across the greater Mara ecosystem. And also, having, uh, you know, um, uh, empowering our rangers, you know, uh, we we have a, 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 our, angel, our rangers are excellent. They are really the backbone of MEP. And if we can, you know, we are working towards, you know, um, uh, seeing the possibilities of their lives, their lives, their future, you know, lives after being a ranger. Uh, how, how does that look like? And tying it up to our vision of empowering them, ensuring that they they have other side hustles as well. You know, flying drones, can, can they can do that. You know, they can shoot gigs. If any of you have, have weddings coming up maybe this year or even next year, holla at us. We can hook you up with, with one of our rangers. They can come there, shoot your wedding at, at a small fee, you know. And so these are some of the things that we are looking you know, to, 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 to understand the future conservationist. Uh, what do they think about conservation? Uh, what do they want to see? Uh, how do they want to be involved? And we are happy that we are having this conversation with students, because as I mentioned earlier, you are the next conservationist, you are the next research, researchers, you are the next uh, CEOs and people sitting at the decision making table. So how the, does that future look, look like for you? So at Marel, we believe that it's doable and coexistence is really at the forefront of our 
of our of our goal and you know working hand in hand with partners with stakeholders and with the community as well to drive meaningful change and conservation forward Wow, Dibla, thank you so much for that answer. You've actually answered what was going to be my next question, which was, do you have any words of inspiration for our students at the Wildlife Tourism College going into the industry that you're in? But I think you've just summed it up really perfectly there. So thank you so much. Um, a few comments in the chat. One from Bridget, great presentation, very interesting. Thank you so much. Um, and Tecla says, great presentation, thank you. Then Ruby Ben, thank you for the presentation, very informative. And I just want to say that I really echo all of these sentiments because it really was a fantastic presentation. Um, we do have just one final question that Jonathan and Puya has just put in the chat, if you wouldn't mind answering. Um, do Mar Elephant Project feel that they have done community sensitization to help reduce conflict between the locals and elephants? So as a community-centric organization, we work very closely with the community and we have a hotline number and this number is very busy. We get a lot of calls uh, from the community, you know, uh, to come and, uh, you know, uh, move elephants away from the farms, move elephants uh, from inside fences in farms. So uh, we, we are really working hand in hand with the community as well. And uh, as we mentioned, our rangers are from the community. They are... Um, they understand the landscape. They understand, you know, the ins and outs of, you know, the wildlife. How 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 things things are done. So uh, we feel that we 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 have really connected and we are really working hand in hand with the community to drive, you know, uh, uh, the protection of elephants and their habitats, and also ensuring that the community derives benefits in terms of uh, what Wilson just shared. There, uh, the benefits that we offer. Uh, so um, community. Uh, conservation, community-led conservation is really key to our agenda and hand-in-hand -hand with the community, so with some of the programs that we, we have here at MEP. Fantastic. So thank you so much for that answer. Okay, um, if we don't have any more questions, then I think we will end the session. I just wanted to say a massive thank you to Peterson and all the students at the Wildlife Tourism College for, you know, engaging with us and from learning from these talks and allowing us to um, to showcase the amazing work that everyone's been doing throughout the series. Divlex Wilson, thank you so, so, so much for giving us your time and your information and for such wonderful answers to the questions. Really fantastic talk and yeah, thank you for all the amazing work that you're doing. <laughs> thank you so much, Ciel, for your time. And uh, the students are wishing you all the best. And you're welcome to visit the facility. We can take you uh, around property, you know, uh, meet the team that are working hard here and, uh, yeah, get to connect like that. So thank you so much for your time. And um, until next time, go ahead, Rini-san. Fantastic. Yeah, and thank you to all our wonderful audience joining from all over the world. We really appreciate you.